Good morning. Good afternoon. Good whatever time of the day it is, right? I suppose it doesn't matter in these in these times. Uh, my name is Dr. Michael Kelly, and uh, I'm so pleased to provide a presentation here at the uh, at this conference. Um, there's no way you can know the amount of time, uh, the preparation that went into developing this conference. Uh, of course, like anybody else, uh, we had to adjust this conference in response uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, you know, on one hand, I'm I'm really sad that I, I won't have the opportunity to see a live audience, um, to sort of look at your faces and adjust to what I'm saying in response to what I'm seeing, uh, to engage with you with any questions or discussions. Uh, on the other hand, I hope that having this format um, will really help us reach a much wider audience, um, you know, than we would have reached otherwise, right? If we were on campus live, uh, and then hopefully we can positively affect a number, a greater number of people um, in this format. Uh, so I'd like to uh, first um, begin by thanking uh, the dean of the Penisco College of Professional Studies, Dr. Deborah Pellegrino, uh, for her leadership in this conference. Um, you know, when I first arrived here at the University of Scranton uh, back in January of 2020, I walked down the hall and I saw all of the posters from the previous disability conferences. And uh, I, it's just so exciting. It must be such an exciting thing for Dr. Pellegrino to have ownership and leadership over this conference. Um, and uh, I really feel quite honored to be a part of it. Um, I'd also like to thank the rest of the committee for all the hard work that went into arranging uh, this online execution uh, of the conference. And uh, you know, if you see any of those team members, you, they look tired, um, that is why. Uh, I'm also so grateful for this incredible all-star lineup of speakers uh, that we have here at this conference. I mean, it's just absolutely remarkable. And um, you know, to be able to take you know, my name, my likeness, and put it up with theirs is, is really quite an honor and uh, quite a thrill. Um, so uh, I also want to tell you that, uh, you know, we're living in this COVID-19 world, obviously. And what that means is uh, I've got four children here in the house. I'm in the attic. They're downstairs. Uh, sixth grader, seventh grader, and two kindergartners. And, uh, and they're doing homeschool. And so there's a possibility someone's going to open that door, someone's going to fight, and, I'll, and I'll, you'll get to see a, sort of a live action uh, parenting, who knows what can happen. So we'll see. Hopefully it won't, but, but it might. Um, you know, finally, uh, just by way of um, introduction here, um, I hope you'll notice that the collaborators within um, this Autism Collaborative Centers of Excellence uh, or ACE, uh, we're all highlighted on the conference website. And I, I think I can speak for everyone when I say that we are in great debt. Um, as, as University of Scranton, all the members of the collaborative and the members of the, of the 13 county area uh, in which we're serving, we are absolutely in debt to the All One Foundation for their generosity, their vision, their leadership for having this amazing idea to integrate a wide variety of agencies, people, community partners uh, into this collaborative. And, um, and you're seeing that shine right now. Um, and in this collaborative, you can put the pieces together to form a synergy. Uh, that means we can do much greater, much bigger things together than we could possibly do on our own. Uh, and I encourage you to watch um, the videos uh, that are on the website um, from the All One Foundation, sort of describing the vision uh, for uh, that the All One Foundation has for serving individuals with autism, among the many other uh, outstanding and wonderful community uh, things that they do. Um, so the All One Foundation in the past, uh, currently, and in the future, it, su it supports people, parents, agencies, you know, anyone. Um, who, who cares for or is someone with autism. Uh, so anyway, I'm, uh, I'm absolutely um, delighted to be in a position uh, to present to you today. So um, I chose um, this topic, right? Um, the science underlying early intervention for autism and related disabilities uh, across the lifespan for a really specific reason. Um, so first of all, this is my area of expertise. So I am a clinician, uh, I'm an educator, and I'm a researcher. 
Uh, I've read and I know the research that guides what the state of the art uh, clinical practice is for those who are diagnosed with autism. Um, this surprises people sometimes um, because my dominant um, sort of professional identity is as a, a doctoral level board certified behavior analyst. Uh, but I'm actually a licensed psychologist. Uh, I, I attended an APA, American Psychological Association, uh, an APA approved program in psychology and, uh, and did a pre-doctoral internship and a postdoctoral fellowship. And I'm a psychologist, but I'm also a behavior analyst. And I've done hundreds of diagnostic evaluations for children who were uh, at risk of autism. And, uh, you know, usually when um, a parent uh, knows something's wrong or thinks something's wrong or a pediatrician says they think something's wrong, if they end up into a diagnostic evaluation for autism, um, you're likely to produce that, that, uh, that diagnosis or something related, right? Um, so I've done that a lot of times. Uh, as an educator, uh, I've trained hundreds of students in classrooms uh, and in clinics on the principles of applied behavior analysis and psychology, uh, but specifically how to apply them uh, to ameliorate the symptoms of autism, right? We're about providing services to make the lives uh, of those who live with autism a little bit better. Here's the thing though, right? My entire uh, practice virtually, my entire practice uh, virtually, my entire research has been dedicated to early identification, diagnosis as soon as possible, and then the execution of empirically based, scientifically valid early intervention services. And what that usually means, as I'm gonna talk about in a little bit, is that you, um, you produce a series of intervention strategies that you do for something like two to four years, from the age of about two to four, that's where you start, right? So you start between the ages of around two to four, you do the therapy for like two to four years. And the goal is to as early as possible and as quickly as possible, get a lot of therapy to produce the greatest trajectory change in outcome. That having been said, there are school age children with autism there are adolescents with autism. There are young adults with autism. There are middle-aged people with autism and there are old people with autism. Autism affects the lifespan. It's not like autism just affects the 18 month to you know, 48 month old children, right? That's where my major practice is, but we need to think across the entire lifespan. And even though the term early intervention typically has a very, very, very specific meaning Right? When someone says early intervention, they're thinking at really young age. I like to think of it a little differently. So the challenges at each stage of the lifespan are a little bit different. Right? Getting the diagnosis, getting the early therapy, it's kind of one stage. Entering to school, that's another stage. Entering to adolescence, that's another stage. Transitioning out of school, that's another stage. And on and on, right? And as those challenges change, one way to sort of look at the lifespan is to say, you always want to be in a position to be thinking about early intervention for the next stage. So I don't want to hear about a kid going into first grade and no one's thought about the preparation for what's going to happen when that transition happens. Puberty happens to everybody. I don't want to hear that as a kid enters into adolescence, no one thought about it. We should be thinking about it years ahead of time and engaging in best practice, scientifically validated early intervention strategies for those upcoming lifespan challenges. What everyone wants, right? People diagnosed with autism, parents, teachers, caregivers, even researchers, right? What do they want? They want to do whatever they can to maximize the likelihood of the greatest integration into community settings, greatest independence as possible. Preparation is going to be key. Now, before I get too much into, into the science and start making your eyes kind of glaze over, um, <clears throat> I want to start off with a, a pretty specific statement that's geared, um, I don't know, almost exclusively uh, to parents uh, of a child uh, or children sometimes, right, with autism. Um, and, uh, I mean, 
this is a message for other people too, I guess, uh, because it's factual based. Um, but I sort of want to take off the researcher hat and the presenter hat and uh, maybe put on the clinician hat and really describe for you something that I think is really important when, um, when interacting with a family uh, who brought a child in to a facility, an office, um, and, uh, and they want to know if their child has autism. And, uh, you know, I'm getting like a pit in my stomach right now thinking about it because I'm thinking to myself, you know, I've got four children, as I mentioned, um, all being very well behaved right now. And uh, I'm thinking about what that feels like when, um, when something's wrong or you think something's wrong. And I'm feeling that pit in my stomach right now, even though nothing's wrong, right? But I'm thinking about it. But now imagine you're a parent, you know something's wrong. You just don't know what it is. And you know you're going to hear something that's not great news. It's either going to be autism, or it's going to be something different, right? But you, if you're there looking for a diagnosis, it means that something, something's missing, there's something extra's happening, there's something, right, that you're worried about. And it is an incredibly stressful, incredibly vulnerable time for parents, right? And so I wanted to start off with a message that I send to parents in the context of a diagnostic evaluation. And, and it's, it's super simple. And, and the, the message is, it's not your fault. And it's, it's nobody's fault, right? So it's not your fault. It's not your spouse's fault or your significant other. It's not what you ate. It's not, you know, what medicine you took. It's not that you didn't exercise enough. There is nothing that you as a parent did at any point during pregnancy, during the young years, that led to the moment when you're in an office at the conclusion of a diagnostic evaluation and a clinician tells you that autism is the appropriate diagnosis. And what's interesting is I, the reason I, I sort of start off with that sometimes is, um, you know, as I gain more experience with diagnostic evaluations, um, you sort of realize, you know, what do, what do parents sort of naturally do? I mean, they want to know, was it me? Did I do something wrong? Um, could I have prevented this? They want to protect their babies, right? And, and, and know what happened. And it's not always possible. Um, and this is one of those cases where it just, uh, it just isn't. And for, um, you know, I think for the, the sake of the parents' mental health and for the, um, the sake of a starting point, right, of um, getting closure around this is, this is where we are, right? This is a, a condition that is present. And there's things that we need to start planning and doing. And um, I feel like there needs to be this acknowledgement that, um, that there's no blame to go around. And I know that, that you can say it to a parent and they'll say thank you and, um, and try to integrate that into their emotions, but that's not an easy thing to do. Uh, but I think you need to hear it over and over again um, because it's true. Uh, you know, whether you know, we like it or not, for better or worse, uh, autism is an equal opportunity condition doesn't matter where you live, doesn't matter the color of your skin, doesn't matter your religion, social, economic status. I mean, you cannot buy your way out of a diagnosis of autism. I mean, you can buy therapy later um, with money, but um, you cannot, there's, there's just no way to buy your way out of that situation. So North Pole to South Pole, East to West, with very little variation, uh, the rate of autism is about 1.5%. Uh, and there's not a single thing you can do to prevent it. The science is not there right now. Don't know if it ever will be, but it's not there now. And you should know that. <clears throat> All right, so let's talk about um, early signs uh, of autism. All right, so we're going to go in this order uh, in the lifespan because uh, time moves in one direction, right? So uh, imagine that you are an experienced uh, parent. And um, maybe you already have one kid, two kids, three kids, uh, and then you have another baby. And uh, with this, uh, this baby we're talking about here, 
and the parent already has a ton of experience watching developmental growth, right? Watching a child or multiple children meet developmental milestones. And so as an experienced parent, you might be able to see some of those more subtle signs um, very early on, right? So for example, an experienced parent will have a really good sense of things like when eye contact and, um, and bids for joint attention, uh, pointing, babbling, saying the first words like, or sounds like da da ma ma ba ba, uh, saying the first word, saying the first two word phrase, and then entering into um, fluent speech, right? Which really happens pretty young, like between the ages of three and four years old. Um, that parent might be really, uh, really sensitive to those things and be able to, to detect you know, really early if there's something not developing as the parent sort of expect it. Um, and then like on the other hand, you might have a parent who uh, is a first time parent, um, doesn't have any nieces and nephews, friends don't have uh, children yet. And perhaps that parent wouldn't be as sensitive to some of those early signs of meeting uh, or of not meeting developmental milestones. And then there's other things too, right? That can interact with um, a child's development that will either increase the chances or decrease the chances that the early signs of autism will be uh, noticed at all and then, and then acted upon. And of course, those are two different things, right? Um, noticing the symptoms and then doing something about it are, are different things. And then, so I have some examples, right? And, and I, uh, these aren't the only examples. These are just sort of examples I've thought of in my uh, clinical practice. And I don't want to suggest that there's anything better or worse about social, social economic status. I'm just, I'm just making up some stories here, okay? So uh, I've seen um, parents who are really well edu educated, right? Maybe two doctors, two lawyers, a lawyer and a doctor, right? you know, top, top tier education. Um, and, and they'll see right away that there's a problem, okay? And then they'll, they'll act on it. Um, I've seen uh, parents who are very well educated uh, and they don't seem to notice, right? Uh, perhaps they're in denial. Uh, perhaps uh, there's one parent who sort of is the dominant parent in the household and is in denial and the other parents not. And because of that interaction, they don't get help. Right? That, I've seen that happen as well. Uh, I've seen young inexperienced parents uh, who are lucky enough to have friends and family who say, uh, I think there might be something you should talk to the pediatrician about. I've seen some parents who insist that it is perfectly normal for a five-year-old uh, who hasn't started talking yet. Um, in fact, I had a, a parent tell me that um, he, uh, it was the dad, uh, that he didn't talk to his eight years old. And I knew that that was almost certainly fake and false. I almost, I would bet virtually anything that is not true, uh, that this, uh, this guy didn't talk to his eight years old and then he was, we were having a perfectly fine conversation. I just, it's just not likely. Uh, and so whether he believed it and it was not true or may, whether he made it up to offset what was happening with his own kid, I don't know, right? But it happened. Uh, and finally, uh, and I say this to you uh, from a, um, I want to say from a, a humble position, I hope, and, um, and sort of from a position of vulnerability, um, being very um, transparent with you that I am a, uh, a Caucasian male and an American, which places me in a, uh, a statistical stat status that means I have a, a pretty easy life, right? And I know that, um, I, I, that having been said, I do have to talk about cultural differences sometimes. And uh, I understand I'm not in the best position of strength to do that. Um, and so I, I sort of wish um, now that I'm saying these things uh, that I had <laughs> um, sort of gotten some feedback from someone on, on how to ex express this exactly. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll express the the, the notion, and uh, and I'll, I'll, my apologies if it doesn't come across as sensitively as it should. Uh, but I've I've definitely seen the influence of cultural pressures on the extent to which a family will accept the reality of a diagnosis of autism, and then act upon that diagnosis of autism. There's no question that's happened, and, and the list the list goes on and on, right? Um, and it could be an, an endless combination of factors that influence the timing and the reactions uh, of a, um, you know, of, of noticing it and acting upon a diagnosis of autism. Um, so even though it is a big deal to even figure out how to get a diagnosis and pay for it and all that stuff, um, and that's a whole other discussion, 
I'm going to kind of skip that part and get to the science of uh, intervention. And, um, you know, there's a lot of studies. Um, when I say a lot, I'm talking like an absolutely um, voluminous, voluminous uh, research uh, database uh, that all point in the exact same direction. Um, and it's all relative to the actions that someone should take when there's a diagnosis of autism uh, between the ages of about 18 months and 48 months, right? So year and a half to four years of age. And there's wiggle room on either side of that. And I've got stories, you know, on either side of that. And there's science on either side of that. Uh, but I'm talking about what the, what the science mainly supports in terms of what, what you should do. Um, and uh, so big picture answer first, and then we'll delve into the, uh, into the specifics, okay? So the answer is to get your kid uh, engaged in early intensive behavioral intervention as your primary choice of therapy. Um, hey, someone might have a different opinion about that. You can go to YouTube and um, people think different things. Um, I don't, from my point of view, it doesn't matter to me what someone's selling. It doesn't matter if it's a sports figure or if it's Jenny McCarthy or whoever's saying it. Uh, I'm going to go with the science, right? Have you heard that lately? You see that on the news all the time, right? I'm going to look at the data and I'm going to go with the science. And the science says you do ABA or Applied Behavior Analytic Early Intervention Therapy. Uh, now, there's various names uh, that are uh, either similar to synonymous with early uh, intensive behavioral intervention, such as its acronym, EIBI. Um, you might hear Applied Behavior Analysis, Early Intervention, EI, Discrete Trial uh, Instruction, Discrete Trial Training, Natural Environment Training, Incidental Teaching, right? Th these, these are all either talking about the same thing or similar things or things that would be included in a, uh, an early intervention strategy for ameliorating the symptoms uh, of autism, right? And setting someone up for the best possible uh, outcome. It can be really confusing to uh, keep track of which are the same, which are similar, um, when to use what and different uh, programmatic uh, techniques, how to judge their efficacy. Um, so we'll start with the basics, um, including the history. So in 1987, uh, Lovas uh, published a study that he conducted at the University of California in Los Angeles, uh, or UCLA. And in that study, he randomly assigned um, children who are ages two through four to two different groups, all right? So one group received about 40 hours per week of intensive therapy, and the other group received about 10 hours per week of intensive therapy. Uh, but before they did that, they did a bunch of pre-measures, right? cognitive scores, academic scores, behavioral skills, social skills, right? a whole array of, um, of, uh, of assessments. So they had a pre-measure, and then they did these therapies, and then they had a post-measure, okay? And uh, at the end of the study, they compared them, and, uh, and they found something absolutely remarkable that has become the basis and the foundation for um, applied behavior analytic early intervention therapy. Uh, the clinical practice, the, the procedures, the science, all of that. So uh, after about two to four years, the, uh, the children who uh, were in the 40 hour per week group had a, an incredibly robust outcome, okay? So, uh, and that was compared to those in the 10 hour per week group. And so specifically 47% of the children from the 40 hour per week group were labeled as indistinguishable from their peers by first grade. And only 2% of the children from the 10 hour per week group achieved that same status as indistinguishable from their peers. Now look, indistinguishable from your peers. That doesn't sound too uh, touchy feely or fuzzy or more loving or parent-like, okay? But th this is a scientific study and they defined indistinguishability from peers as going into first grade and having um, measures in cognitive, academic, social, emotional, across all those measures, right? Measures that were the same, indistinguishable from the first grade peers who had never been diagnosed with autism. So it didn't mean that the kids didn't have autism anymore. It didn't mean, didn't mean that they didn't meet the criteria, uh, but you could not tell the difference with these measures between the children who had had autism diagnosed and went through the 40 hour per week therapy and then the first graders who had never had that therapy or never had a diagnosis. 47%, only 2% of the other group, okay? Now here's the thing. Um, 
even children from the 53% who were still distinguishable from the peers had amazing outcomes compared to the 10 hour group. For example, many of those children, although they were distinguishable from the peers, they were in a mainstream classroom with uh, some support, pull out services, whatever it might be. Uh, and then of course there were some children who were non-responders, right? Um, and, uh, and so this was a remarkable study and it, um, it really, really, um, it brought people much hope, right? It, it laid the groundwork for what we should be doing, what we should be studying, what we should be doing clinically with children who are diagnosed with, uh, with autism. Uh, but there's lots, uh, well, and of course, because we identified a specific course of therapy that really helped. Um, but you might be asking yourself things like, well, that was a small number of children. Only 40 children went through that study. Would it apply to other children in other settings? Um, did the results last and things like that? Uh, and, um, and those studies have been conducted. So, so first of all, Lobos and his team published a follow-up in 1993 with those same children. Uh, and they showed that the same children from the 1987 study. And they showed that the treatment effects lasted. They lasted over time. Um, and they found that the children from the 10 hour group did not make improvements, right? So um, the treatment produced differences and they were robust. They lasted over time. Um, second, there have been many, and when I say many, many studies replicating the effects of LOVAS 1987. Um, they have um, shown without question, right? The scientific literature is, is not questioned. If you implement treatment generally described as by Lovas, you can expect about half of those children will be indistinguishable from their peers by first grade. Now, of course, the science, the subsequent practice, it has uh, developed and, and changed over time. So for example, Lovas et al., uh, they simply described this early intervention program uh, that was based on the principles of applied behavior analysis. And even though you can get your hands on some of the curriculum materials, um, it wasn't organized in a coherent curriculum fashion like things are today, where they're actually, you can buy a curriculum, right, for early intervention. You can go to Google and find it. Um, and these are, these are, you know, empirically validated curricula. Uh, in the subsequent decades uh, of research, uh, we've learned how to conduct initial assessments, ongoing assessments, interventions, like in particular orders, uh, to maximize the efficiency of the interventions. And so even though the treatments are still based on the principles of applied behavior analysis and um, the treatment is still characterized as early intensive behavioral intervention, uh, the science and the practice has, has obviously evolved considerably since 1987, as you would expect. Uh, interestingly, kind of went hand in hand with this is that there have been many changes at the um, state and federal level um, that have made this uh, type of therapy more available and accessible to children diagnosed with autism. So for example, in 1998, um, we had the um, founding of the Behavior Analysis Certification Board, um, which set standards, um, practice ethics standards for people who um, engage in behavior analysis and subsequently will do therapy for children uh, diagnosed with autism. Uh, and then uh, all 50 states now uh, have some sort of law uh, that mandates uh, Medicaid or private insurance companies to make early intervention therapy available for children who are diagnosed uh, with autism. Uh, it's not easy though, right? I mean, parents still have an uphill battle um, to get access to therapy. Uh, there's big barriers. Uh, for example, sometimes insurance companies will deny uh, that there's a medical necessity for the services, uh, despite medical doctors, psychologists, behavior analysts, you know, making the case for necessity of services. Uh, some companies will uh, actually illegally at this point uh, claim that ABA and early intervention are experimental procedures and thus haven't been proven, so they, don't, they won't pay for it. Um, it's sometimes hard to find a clinic that has openings, right? So parents can face long wait lists. Uh, and to be frank, um, this is one of the reasons why we here at the University of Scranton developed um, the minor in applied behavior analysis, uh, the post certificate uh, program for behavior analysis and the um, upcoming to be launched in the fall of 2021, Masters of Science in Applied Behavior Analysis. Um, we want to be part of the growing solution for parents and caregivers, right? I mean, we want to make sure parents, teachers, caregivers, anyone who needs access to uh, services can actually get them. 
Um, and, uh, and so that's what we're doing. You know, we want to be a part of that solution. Now, um, we can kind of circle back, um, you know, made this really strong statement that, uh, if you're going to do something, it's got to be ABA based early intervention. And, uh, let's say that you're someone who doesn't uh, do or doesn't like ABA based early intervention, and you wanted to have a discussion about it or an argument, um, you can find alternatives. No doubt about it, right? Uh, go to your favorite search engine and do a quick literature search, or do a, just a quick search, uh, autism intervention, autism assessment, or whatever it might be, and you will find, uh, I don't know, 70 million results. That's how Google works, right? Um, you'll find uh, offers for hyperbaric chambers, B12 vitamin injections, stem cell injections, play-based therapy, uh, facilitated, Communication training, rapid response method, or RPM, you know, a whole host of other allegedly effective interventions for ameliorating the symptoms of autism. Um, the problem is none of these procedures have any in, uh, scientific support for their efficacy. There's no science behind them. Now, um, sometimes, maybe all the time, uh, parents will want to do anything and everything they can do to help their children and I totally understand, and I totally support that. And I've got specific advice, right? And my advice is, and this is not just for autism, right? This would be for cancer, diabetes, broken leg. It doesn't matter. Spend every minute, spend every dollar, spend every resource you have on procedures that are scientifically supported. Start there and exhaust your energy using scientifically supported methods. And then if you wish to try something else, as long as it's not counterproductive, if you want to try something else to help your baby, go ahead and do it. That's fine, right? But don't spend time, money, resources, time especially, doing things that have not been shown to be empirically validated. Now, in addition to ABA-based early intervention therapy, there's absolutely other associated therapies that uh, children may need that are, that are scientifically supported, right? Uh, almost always, almost always speech therapy is warranted. So speech therapists and applied behavior analysts both work on language production. We just do different things, right? They're complementary. They actually work really well together. Um, there's also symptoms, um, some that are core symptoms of autism, like stereotypic behavior that can interfere with, interfere with therapy and education um, or other behaviors that are not core symptoms of autism um, like self-injury, um, aggression, um, pica, other destructive behavior, tantrums, elopements, uh, things like that, uh, feeding difficulties. Um, if those come up, there's therapies that, um, that children with autism will need, right? Some can be applied by the, uh, a, a behavior analyst and some can't. And so it makes sense to, to seek those out when they're necessary. But when you're talking about a time sensitive um, thing like early intervention and you have a scientifically supported um, program to do, you, you should do it. Um, there's other things too, of course, that, that uh, challenges that children with autism um, uh, face. Um, children with autism often require um, say intensive toileting procedures um, to achieve continent uh, bathroom use, and then children with autism will often have greater uh, medical needs than other children, right? Like risk of uh, seizure disorders, um, higher risk of gastrointestinal disorders, higher need for medications. L look, the list is lengthy, right, of challenges encountered by those with autism. Um, but fortunately, there is an established and continuously growing research database that can guide therapists and parents on what to do uh, to respond uh, to those challenges. Okay, so the next part of the uh, lifespan, right? School integration. And, um, you know, again, we want to start uh, planning for this early, right? And so um, typically you'll start the transition out of early intervention between the ages of about four years through seven. And if a kid makes great progress through early intervention, uh, it may make sense to start integrating that child into a daycare or preschool, right? Along with the concurrent uh, implementation of the uh, early intervention therapy at a reduced level. So maybe instead of 30 hours a week of early intervention, you might go to a daycare or preschool in the morning and then get the early intervention for 15 hours a week in the afternoons. 
Uh, over time, of course, the goal is to reduce or eliminate the intensive therapy um, as the child is successful in the daycare or preschool environment. And generally speaking, this would be my, like, my ideal scenario, right? That the early intervention started really early, the results are fantastic, and you can start the integration process really early. You have tons of time to prepare for entry into school. Uh, but for, for many children, um, they're not going to be ready for integration that early. And so the target might be integration into a, a kindergarten or first grade classroom. And if that's the case, um, therapists should build into the intervention uh, program opportunities to adjust you know, to a group-based teaching format that will be encountered in the kindergarten years or, or beyond. And this is the early intervention for, for school, right, where you're practicing in like a controlled, safe environment uh, for what's going to happen in the upcoming years. And so uh, as you can kind of put together here, for this age range between like four and seven, that's when the team is really contemplating this uh, integration strategy and it's a critical time, right? You want to put a lot of thought and work into dedicating uh, to a plan for transition from these early intensive um, services to a school-based environment. And that's the early intervention for school part, right? Um, and then most often when a child is integrated into a school, um, that child will have a, um, an early, or I'm sorry, an intensive um, individualized uh, education plan. And that plan will specify the goals, uh, the means to reach the goals, uh, how you collect data and all that uh, for the school year. And then oftentimes you have behavior analytic assessments that are built into those plans, right? Um, uh, and so at that point, you know, the manner with which a child will interact with the educational system for the next like 13 or 14 years is going to be established. So it's really important to make sure that that's planned and planned very, uh, very carefully. And, and, you know, and during, uh, during school, the school years, this is when children are going to encounter massive challenges, right? Um, they're going to grow physically, emotionally, intellectually. And uh, this is for all children. And these challenges are going to be greatly enhanced for those who are diagnosed uh, with autism, of course. And that individualized education plan is designed to help those children uh, with the support they need uh, to be maximally uh, successful. Uh, and so, of course, uh, as this child is increasingly integrated into an educational environment, the team needs to focus on a bunch of things to ensure that that child's most likely to be uh, successful. And education will be the overarching dominant factor in a school. Uh, but of course, it's the school's job to ensure the child can engage with the curriculum in the most uh, effective way possible. Uh, and, uh, but the team has to focus on a ton of factors, right? Like, um, you know, will the child be placed in an environment that meets his or her needs? And the goal, of course, is um, the least restrictive environment. And this is not, this is not a comprehensive list, right? But um, you know, generally speaking, any old kid in a neighborhood has a school that is assigned to them because they live in, in, in that particular zone. And you're gonna go to whatever classroom you're supposed to go to in that school, right? Uh, and then if, when you start talking about making the environments more restricted, you might be in a regular uh, classroom in a local school with support. And then it might be a different classroom at your local school, and then maybe a different school and on down the list. And it's the team's job to make sure that the child is in the environment that's going to be least restrictive but most supportive as possible. And that might change over time, right? Someone might kind of drift in and out of the different um, levels of, of restriction in these environments uh, to be able to be maximally responsive to the child's needs. Um, but the whole time, right? Um, there should be opportunities to engage um, socially, right? At lunchtime with specials. Um, and, and to note some of those um, really big um, risks that are um, that are out there actually so um, like for example um, you know children with autism you know not just do they have um, big needs for academic behavior social behavior and skill development um, but also risk assessment right um, children with autism are at greater risks uh, uh, for being bullied right for reporting feelings of loneliness uh, for unnoticed medical conditions, unnoticed mental health conditions that are comorbid with autism. And the team has to be vigilant, vigilant about looking out for these things, right? Uh, recognize that children with autism are going to have uh, at least similar, if not greater challenges um, than any other child who's entering into uh, adolescence, right? And, and specifically um, planning for that. Um, our bodies change, right? When you go into adolescence, that cannot be stopped. That's going to happen. 
And there's going to be physical, hormonal, emotional, many other changes uh, that any child will experience during, uh, during adolescence. And it is magnified for those diagnosed with autism. Uh, and so it's going to be uh, critical that someone's paying attention on a, a daily basis, a minute to minute basis, if possible, um, to what's happening. And if at any point in time, a team member sees something that the team member or the whole team should react to, that you can make the necessary plans uh, to the or changes to the plan, and then of course to the surrounding environment. Um, but all this, uh, all this planning for entering into adolescence, for example, again early intervention. You know, you be planning for that uh, as time goes on. Uh, and then there's transition um, from school and into the rest of rest of your life, right? And so school services end. I mean, imagine. Imagine you, you, you're diagnosed with autism, uh, or perhaps you care for someone uh, who's diagnosed with, with autism, and you have this daily and annual structure that has been going on since like age three, and now it's going to just like end one day. And your question is, what am I going to do? Okay, you better have planned for it. Early intervention for transition from school. I'm talking at age 12, 15, 18. You want to be ready so when that age 21, 22 hits, whatever the plan is, whatever the needed skills are, the plan's been developed and implemented, the skills have been taught, they've been assessed, they've been shown to work, and you're ready, okay? What is the living situation going to be? It runs the gamut. There are situations where those with autism will be fully dependent on their parents, other family members, or on some other um, uh, living arrangement where there's, there's not independence. And that's, that's just how it is for some people. And it needs to be planned for if that's gonna be the case. Um, for other individuals, um, there could be any range of living on your own or with others with some support to living literally on your own with some support or functioning completely independently. And it's gonna be somewhere on that range. Again, planning early, what are the skills needed to produce the most independence, the most integration as possible and planning that out early? What about an occupational situation? Uh, I don't wanna get too, uh, too into this uh, because it, again, it could be a whole other um, hours long discussion. Um, but uh, there are systems in place, which I'm glad they're in place and they're excellent. And I do not wish to in any way impugn them. But there's systems in place for individuals with disabilities to work in hotels or work in the back rooms of uh, stores or something like that. And I'm glad, I'm glad that's there. But it is a step in the right direction. It's not an end. Okay? It's not enough. It's not enough. The environment, the community needs to be ready to absorb, engage with, and embrace individuals with autism in occupational situations. I encourage you, if you're interested in this, um, to um, look at, um, just again, go to a website and search for um, CARD, C-A-R-D, which is Center for Autism and Related Disorders uh, at the University of South Florida. So there's seven of these cards in Florida. They're um, funded by the Department of Education. Um, but I, I know well uh, the people and the programs at the University of South Florida. And they take this unbelievably wonderful um, sort of philosophical mission perspective, which is um, you're not going to look out in the environment and look at the slim pickings of occupational opportunities for those with autism and then put, put someone with autism in a situation that they might not even like. Right? So imagine if you're 15 or 18 or 21 and someone tells you what your job is going to be and that's what you got to do the rest of your life. Why in the world would that be acceptable for someone with autism? Right? Absolutely not. And so what they do uh, is they work closely with local businesses. Uh, they work with the state to try to arrange opportunities for what a person with autism wants and get that person the skills that that person needs to be successful in that environment. It totally flips the script, right? You're not dependent on a grocery store or hotel 
opening their doors to their back rooms to be filled with people with autism. You're talking about working with someone with autism and saying, what do you want? And helping that person develop the skills that person needs to be successful for the rest of their life. But you know what it takes? It takes early intervention. It takes planning. Uh, finally, financial stability. Some people with autism will be fully dependent on others for the rest of their lives. Some will be independent and there's going to be a continuum in between. I do want to tell you that there is an industry now that is dedicated to helping parents of individuals with autism and related disabilities to figure out what they can do to maximize the likelihood that they will be in a strong financial position uh, to serve that individual for a lifetime of need. Uh, and, uh, and I encourage you to look, that, look for that if you need it. Um, but it's a grow, it's sort of a growing sort of boutique industry and it's a much needed one and I'm, I'm super glad that it's there. With that, I wanna thank you for your time and your attention. Uh, I, am, I am happy to uh, talk to anyone who wishes to chat more about the things I talked about, uh, engage in discussion, uh, maybe come up with a creative endeavor together uh, that we can do to help serve um, those living with autism. I'm always happy to hear that. And so feel free to contact me through the University of Scranton with that. I hope you enjoyed this presentation and the other presentations, and I thank you so much for attending.